Now, a proportional representation system is quite different. Here, what we're talking about are the use of multi-member districts, MMDs. So you will see that acronym, SMD versus MMD. These are multi-member districts. What that means is if you take that circle and then draw lots of little circles in there, those are each of your districts. From each of those districts, you're going to have instead of a single member, uh, a single representative that people vote for, people vote for uh, a number of representatives. So there may be um, five in each district. There may be 10 in each district. Um, and people tend to vote for parties rather than specific individual candidates. Okay. So <clears throat> just to explain that, the, the party list system, you vote for the party, each of which has, has its own list of candidates, which is already drawn up. If a particular party gets half the vote in a 10-seat district, it's going to send its first five on the list to the legislature. Um, the goal for the candidates is to be listed as high as possible on that list, because if they get um, five of those seats, well then if you're number six on the list, you're not going to win office. So you, you, there, there are lots of ways um, to, to get up higher on the list, which we'll talk about uh, a lot when we talk about the country studies. So the number one benefit of a system like this is representation. You have fewer wasted votes. Even small percentages can yield representation. Small parties, what this means is small parties have a chance. The number one drawback to this system is governance. You have lots more parties in power who have to work together. Again, it's nice for representation, but it's hard for governing. So the picture that you see here is uh, from the poll in 1991 elections, where you had almost 20 parties in parliament. Again, in the United States, we're talking about basically two parties. In Poland, we were talking about 20 parties. One was called the Polish Beer Lovers Party, Polska Partia Piwa. It was started in 1999, in, sorry, in 1990, to encourage a sort of cultural transition from vodka to beer. It's really about nailing alcoholism. Uh, but then they decided to become a political party. They went out and they won nearly 3% of the vote, which meant that they won 16 seats in the legislative elections in 1991. What this really reflected was voter disenchantment with political changes. If you're going to vote for the beer party, it's probably because you're, uh, uh, you're not happy with, with the big parties that exist. Of course, even this party actually eventually split into factions. We had the Maui Pivo and Duja Pivo parties, so the Little Beer Party and the Big Beer Party. The Big Beer Party, was a serious, it was a serious party. It actually took part in governing coalitions between 1991 and 1993, when you had a high degree of instability. You had four governments um, and, then, and then new elections. But it actually took part in some of these governing coalitions. Now, one way to cut down on the likelihood of the beer parties, Little Beer and Big Beer, getting to power uh, is to create thresholds. Okay, so some countries have a three percent threshold. You need three percent of the vote in order to maintain, in order to 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 get the seats. Now, this wouldn't have helped uh, to eliminate the beer party because they did get three percent of the votes. But lots of other countries have higher ones. For for example, in Germany, the threshold is five percent. If you don't get five percent of the seats, you cannot um, take office with four percent. So, you know, the beer party, the Polish beer party with 3% of the vote, the Polish beer lovers party, sorry, with 3% of the vote would not have gotten any representatives. Um, in Turkey, you've got about 10%. In Poland right now, they did eventually adopt a, an electoral threshold of 5%. But again, looking at, so there's, there's a wide variation. So Turkey's on the much higher level with 10%. Um, now, what you're doing here is, is then you're, you're, you're getting, you're limiting representation in favor of governance. Uh, so this is a, a common theme. It's something that these uh, that states all try to deal with in their own way. Now, especially in a SMD plurality system where it's all or none, right? You either win the elections or you don't. Uh, you can have electoral boundary, sorry, oh, electoral boundaries called constituencies um, that are given. Uh, certain, a certain number of legislative seats that can be drawn in odd shapes to encompass various ethnic groups, class groups, rural versus urban, poor versus rich. And this is known as gerrymandering after one of our own. Uh, the picture that you see here on the left is uh, when the Massachusetts governor, Elbridge Gerry, did this in 1812. He redistricted his state so that it would advantage his party. Uh, looks like this big albatross going down. Um, the simple goal here is to maximize the effect of supporters' votes and to minimize the effect of opponents' votes. 
uh, if you create mixed districts, you can purposely water down the vote of one or the other. So, for example, you've got an SMD plurality state. And let's say we've got the downtrodden liberals uh, that take control over the, over the national legislature, thanks to good fortune. Let's say there was a huge scandal involving the conservatives. Um, and they might look at two districts and try to remake their borders to gain political advantage. So there should be the letter A right here where I'm showing you the cursor. So this is, uh, this is uh, picture A and this is picture B. Um, this is district one and this is district two. So I'm going to simplify this a hundred times, but let's say that there's a perfect correlation that urbanites are, are Democrat, Democrats and, uh, and, and, uh, and rural dwellers are Republicans. And the circle here is the urban dwellers, and everything outside the circle uh, is the rural areas. And so here we've got, uh, and you might want to label this just so it's clear in your head, we've got 55% Democrat and 45% Republican in this district. So what does that mean? That means that here the Democrats are going to win this district. Right? The Democrats are going to win because they have 55%. Now, next, in District 2, we've got 51% Republican and 49% Democratic. So what does that mean? Well, it means that the Republicans are going to win with 51%. So the Democrats get into power and they redistrict. Okay? And so um, what they do is they change the lines. So here's the line that was dividing the districts. What they do is they push over some of the urban voters into this district. Okay? So that what they're doing is they're, they're watering down the urban votes here, but they, they're keeping it enough so that on, uh, in this district they're maintaining 51% urban, okay? but they're getting rid of, of that other 4%, and they're dropping it into the other district. So it's 49% Republican, 51% Democrat. So the Democrats still win by a smaller margin, but it doesn't matter. The Democrats are going to win. Now, in the second district, what you've done is you've gone from 49% Democrat here to 53% Democrat with this 49% plus this 4%. Okay? Now, the Republicans only have 47%. And what you've effectively done is you've won the second district as well. Okay? So the gist is the Democrats in picture A get one seat here. The Republicans get one seat. The Democrats come in and they change the districts around. Okay, and they put some of their voters in this other district. And what they have now is, uh, they, is they win District 1 and District 2 by a slimmer margin, but it doesn't matter in a plurality SMD system. They haven't changed any minds. They haven't engaged in any sort of political cleansing, forcing people to, from their homes. Okay, that would be highly immoral. It wouldn't happen in a liberal democratic state. Um, but what they've done is they've, they've taken control over both the districts through redistricting. Okay? And we just did this in Maryland not long ago. Now, this is much less likely in PR systems since minority parties are still going to get a choice even if they don't win big. Right? They're still going to have representatives. Um, but it can happen, especially to thwart some from going over the threshold um, or to help others get over that threshold. So you can imagine how this would occur there. But it's much more likely in SMD races or electoral systems. So now we're going to move on. We're going to talk a little bit about direct democracy. There are various forms of direct democracy. Uh, we're going to start with referendums. Referendums occur when authorities issue a binding vote on a particular policy. Okay. Um, California does this a lot. Colorado does too. Uh, there is no national referendum in the United States. But Switzerland does have national referendums. Okay. You can give citizens a major role in spheres of government that are frequently left to statesmen, such as foreign policy. And this has occurred in Switzerland. So we'll talk about initiatives and plebiscites in a moment. But here's a great example of a referendum. Switzerland is an island of neutrality. It's not in the European Union. Most of its friends, though, are. And so in 2000, they decided to allow all EU members freedom of movement. You can work and you can study, you can play in Switzerland without visas. In return, the EU promised them open markets. Okay? Um, you can send your stuff over. There won't be tariffs. There won't be duties. And so now the EU is home to more than 60% of Swiss exports. So big deal for Switzerland. Make them more competitive. Problem came when the EU let in two of their most troublesome new members in 2007, Romania and Bulgaria. 
and the Swiss went to the polls in a February 2009 referendum to decide whether to allow Bulgarians and Romanians this freedom of movement. Now, because this was up for referendum, the EU made very clear that if they voted this down, the EU would use what was called a guillotine clause to break off relations, to make trade more complicated and more costly with Switzerland. And this could have had huge financial implications for Switzerland. So the Swiss came out and they voted 59.6% to extend the rights uh, of, of free movement to Bulgarians and Romanians as well. Okay. Uh, but there were lots of racist undertones to the whole campaign. Only 51% of the voters actually came out to the polls. Okay. But this is a great example of using a referendum in a way that you can't imagine that would ever happen in a place like the United States or most other democratic countries where these sorts of policies are left at the government level, okay, more uh, indirect democracy. An initiative is a publicly initiated national referendum. So you have to get a certain number of signatures dispersed over a certain territory, depending on the laws of the state, and then you can have a national referendum. Okay, so it's not a national referendum coming, or, or uh, we, we do this on the state level all the time. Okay, so it would be a statewide referendum. So California started doing initiatives in 1911. And, uh, in 1911, when voters demanded this in an era where railroads were a key, powerful special interest, citizens wanted to oppose these groups. So citizens wrote an initiative. They collected a certain number of signatures based on the percentage of votes that were cast in the last governor, the gubernatorial elections, and this would get on the ballot. It sounds great. It sounds like a great idea to balance off these special interests by having direct citizen input. But there are some problems. Um, now, there are so many initiatives on the ballot that people don't know much about them. Okay? There's also the fact that special interests often use these. They transform this from citizen participation to hugely expensive activities that involve paid rather than activist campaigners and media blitzes. Okay, so the, these are organized and, and, and financed by special interests, defeating the whole purpose. And they can also be quite populist, uh, but clearly not good for the country, for educated policy, from an ed educated policymaker perspective. Um, sure, we could allow people to have their own grenade launchers, good fun, uh, but the police have no way of stopping criminals who have them, right? So that's why we would expect legislators to not support something like this, but... Uh, in a country where people might like to play with grenades, well, we might have something like this passed. Is it good for the state? Well, not necessarily. Um, so some examples from a few years back, there were in, I think this is from California, there was a tax on oil producers that was up for, refer for this. Uh, it was an initiative, so it was up for a state referendum. Uh, uh, there was uh, an initiative to require pregnant teens, parents notification um, in the case of abortion, highly charged issues. Uh, more recently, uh, proposals that have passed to allow rec the recreational use of marijuana, big things which actually counter um, national policy. So very interesting um, uh, conflicts. Finally, the last form of direct democracy are plebiscites. This is when the government authorizes a non-binding referendum. In other words, it's almost a poll of sorts, but it's much more official. So here's a famous case. The Canadian government came to power in 1940, promising there would be no conscription for overseas service during World War II. And then they started to rethink. The war was big. The war was bad. They had a change of plans. They wanted to have the freedom of conscripting and sending their soldiers off to foreign countries. So the government in 1942 held a plebiscite. And a majority in this plebiscite now said conscription was okay uh, for overseas service. Okay. Uh, even though there was particularly strong resistance from French Canadians. Uh, but what this did is it gave the government permission to break a promise. They didn't, they didn't do anything legally binding, but what they did is they said, yes, you made this promise before and now you can break it. It doesn't have to be because they made a promise before. The government wants a strong signal from its constituents. Okay? Uh, in the Canadian case, by 1943, there were a handful of conscripts fighting overseas, uh, but there were never more than a few thousand. So this didn't amount um, to too much. But the government didn't break its promise. Okay. So we'll come to political parties in just a moment.